This video explains the basics of interest rate swap, which is an agreement between two parties to exchange a set of interest payments for another. And in what's called plain vanilla interest rate swap, one party exchanges fixed interest payments for variable interest payments. As illustrated here, one party, let's call him party A, agrees to pay fixed while receiving floating or variable if you like. The fixed interest rate is referred to as the swap rate. There are at least three reasons why a financial institution like a bank would um, engage in an interest rate swap summarized right here. The first is to protect against rising interest rates. You can imagine what happens if you have a loan with variable interest rates. It's going to be difficult to anticipate how much that you're going to have to pay from month to month. And so here, a useful tool for hedging against such interest rate uncertainty is interest rate swap. The second is to reduce the effective cost of debt. I have a separate video on that. And the third one, which is perhaps most important, is to reduce cash flow risk. Now, this type of swap would allow you to match the variability of your interest payments, which are cash outflows, with the variability of your interest income, which are cash inflows. This is an example of how that might work. So here, let's consider a bank that made loans to its customers at a fixed interest rate of 6% per annum. Here, interest is received monthly. So that means that the bank will receive interest income at a fixed monthly rate of 0.5% over 12 months. If this were quarterly payments, then it would have been, what is it, 1.5% per quarter. Anyhow, on the flip side, the bank has a variable rate liability at an annual interest rate of 4.2%, and interest is paid monthly. So this means that the bank will pay interest at 0.35% in the first month. However, it wouldn't know what the interest rates will be afterward. And that's the issue right here. So as you can see, on the fixed rate loan to its borrowers, the bank's monthly cash inflow is known for sure over the entire period. It's going to be based at the rate of 0.5% per month. However, the cash outflows on the variable rate liability are uncertain. So the bank can hedge this cash flow risk with a one-year plain vanilla interest rate swap in which it pays fixed while receiving variable. So by this arrangement, the fixed interest payout on the swap will match the fixed interest income from borrowers. And at the same time, the variable interest income from the swap will match the variable interest payments to the bank's creditors. So here's an example of how to carry out the calculations. So here, firm A enters into a swap in which it pays fixed at 6% while receiving floating. The floating interest rate is going to be based on SOFR, short for secured overnight financing rates, which is a benchmark that is often preferred in transactions such as this. Let's say the swap is going to start on December, uh, in December of the beginning year and carry on with quarterly payments until December of the next year. So here's a summary of the swap agreement. The notional amount of the swap here is $50 million. Notional in the sense that the parties do not exchange this principle. It simply is the basis upon which the fixed and variable rate payments will be determined. And the fixed interest rate, which is called swap rate, is 6%. And we're going to look at this from the viewpoint of firm A that gets to pay a fixed interest rate. The days in year to be used in this transaction is 360, as opposed to make it quick and easy to calculate the math, to do the math, that is. The variable rate here is going to be based on 90-day average so far, since payments are going to be made quarterly. And the settlement type here is called advanced set settled in arrears. So what that means is that on this initiation date, the um, so far, the variable rate on this date will determine, will be used to determine the variable interest payments one quarter ahead on March 15th. Likewise, the 
variable rate, the SOFR rate here on March 15, will be used to determine what the variable rate payments will be on June 15. And so that's how the bid goes on until the end of the swap term. You might ask, why are we doing this? Well, one important reason why the parties may choose to do this is to avoid unpleasant surprises about what the variable interest rates will turn out to be on the payment date. For example, if the variable rate on the settlement date on this payment date is much higher than expected, the party responsible for that payment will likely find it difficult to pay that amount. And so to avoid that embarrassment, the parties decide to base the variable rate payments for each period on the previous period's variable rate. And by that arrangement, they are better prepared ahead of time. So no surprises, no shocks. So based on that, the first payment, which is going to be made right here on March 15th, we know that each quarter firm A is going to be be paying 6%. Adjusted for quarterly payment and multiplied by the notional um, amount comes out to $750,000 every quarter. Now though, the um, SOFR in the quarter before uh, turns out to be 6.45%. So adjusted for quarterly payments, it comes out, the payment here comes out to be 806250 so now you will think that for this to be a swap, as the name suggests, that firm A is going to have to sign a check for 750000 and hand it over to the counterparty and then receive a check for 860250 from the counterparty. But it doesn't really work like that. That'll be childish, isn't it? Because what happens here is that since we know that firm A's payment is less than what it receives, it is simply credited with a net amount of 56250 And that's how it's going to be each quarter. In this second payment, we find that SOFR rate here is exactly the same as the fixed rate. And so, since the cash flows for this period are identical, as you can see, no payments exchange hands. Net payment is zero. And then the third payment, it turns out that the variable rate here is 5.54%, yielding a cash flow of 692500 So, as you can see, since firm A's payment is greater, it simply pays the net amount of 57500 and in the final settlement period, SOFR turns out to be 6.22%. And so once again, since firm A's payment is less, it is credited with a net amount of $27,500. And so that wraps this up, actually. So this is a summary of the transactions. The first payment, firm A wins. Second payment, it's a wash. Third payment, firm A loses, and the fourth payment, firm A wins. So I use wins and losses here contextually because actually, remember, the motivation here is to match the variability of cash inflows with uh, the variability of um, cash outflows and vice versa. Anyhow, so in a separate presentation, I explained the concept and calculation of what's called income gap a concept widely employed in bank management. GAP is the difference between rate-sensitive assets and rate-sensitive liabilities. These are assets and liabilities that mature or which are repriced within the same period. Now though, suppose that rate-sensitive assets uh, amount to $17 million and liabilities $10 million. So, in this case, we say that the gap position of this bank is asset sensitive because the, the bank has a gap of $7 million, the amount by which the assets exceed the liabilities. This, is, this could be dangerous if interest rates fall. Now, as you probably know, the main income measure for banks is net interest income, which is the difference between interest income and interest expense. So check this out. If interest rates fall by, let's say, 1%, what this means is that the, that the bank's interest income is going to fall by 170000 which is 1% of the size of the bank's asset, $17 million. Likewise, interest expenses will go down, but by only $100,000, which is, again, 1% of the uh, bank's liabilities of $10 million. So as you can see, 
because interest income has dropped by a whole lot more than liabilities. The bank's net interest income in this example will drop by $70,000. That's not good. By the way, we can also determine this drop in net interest income by simply multiplying the change in interest rates of 1% by the gap amount of $7 million, right there to get this 70000 bucks. So what are we going to do about this? What can we do about this? Well, as it turns out, we can reduce this interest rate risk by engaging in a plain vanilla interest rate swap for the same period within which gap is determined. And here, we're going to have to do a swap in which the bank will pay variable while receiving fixed. And of course, the notional amount of the swap is going to be the amount of the gap, which is $7 million. So with this arrangement, if, in, if interest rates fall, the savings on the variable rate loan right here on the swap will offset the loss in net interest income. And this is it right here. So if interest rates fall by 1%, you can see that the bank will now pay $70,000 less on its variable rate loan on the swap, which again would be 1% of the notional amount of the swap, $7 million. $70,000. So that's savings right there. And so this savings of $70,000 on the swap will offset the loss of $70,000 in the bank's net interest income, leaving the bank's income position immunized. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.